Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Parenting Reframe podcast. As you know, I am a big fan of my guest's work, and I'm so thrilled to have him here today. Joe Newman, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I, um, I also admire your, I, I saw you on Instagram. I really admire uh, how well you do that. And you're one of the, the few people in the parenting area where I'm nodding my head yes and not no when I listen to you. So I, I, I like, um, it's a pleasure to meet you. Oh my gosh, that really means a lot because I think that is, just to kind of put it in context, when I read your book, and this, I read your book, I think it might've been two or three years ago. And it felt the same way to me that I, I read a lot of parenting books and I read a lot in terms of my backgrounds in early childhood and then my master's in, in speech and language pathology. So I've worked with kids and with parents for a really long time. And when I started to read your book and then when I finished it, I felt like I couldn't say it enough. It was the first book that made complete sense, that was practical, but also very, it had a lot of integrity and it really you explain things in such a beautiful way in terms of why kids need certain boundaries. And particularly when we think of kids that are strong-willed or what some parents will refer to as very spirited. I feel like if I even look at my own career in the last 20 years and I can see how much parenting has, like trends in parenting have changed. And to some extent, when I read your work, it finally was like, oh my gosh, somebody is not making it complicated, right? Like they're just stating the facts and they're, it just makes perfect sense. And so I appreciated it so much. So that coming from you really does mean a lot. So I wanted to start at the beginning. Could you kind of describe a little bit of your journey with ADHD and what led you to Raising Lions? I know it's been a while since you wrote it and I know that... Um, you have a lot of great resources even on your website beyond the book, but what led you to sort of come to this space where you knew this is what you really needed to do? Yeah, so um, I was, I definitely came into the world defiant. Um, and my father tells me of trying to keep me from touching the electrical sockets when I was two and a half, because I was fascinated by them. And at one point, you know, he smacked my hand and said, no, because I kept doing it. And he said, I looked at him and I touched it again and he smacked my hand again. And he said, he probably smacked my hand 25 times. And for 25 times with tears rolling down my face, mm -hmm. I stared him in the eye and I did it again. So um, eventually he just picked me up and carried me to my room and, um, you know, I was just exhausted. But then I was, I was diagnosed as ADHD at the time, it was just called hyperactive. It was 1970. Mm -hmm. um, I was seven years old, and um, and so I, I was I was medicated for a number of years. Then I took myself off when I was 14. But the the mind of the experience of being an ADD person is is unique, and and unless you've lived it, you don't really understand the profound uh, kind of defiance it breeds and the feeling of being condescended to that you live under and this sort of barrage of being told so many things that you already know and how that <clears throat> it builds a negative self-image and it builds a a natural defiance that you come to from a very healthy place um it's not a dysfunction it's it's a it's a reaction to a system of interactions that feels like it leaves you without dignity and and makes you push back um so I left high school with a chip on my shoulder. I I went out in the world. I I probably did 30 jobs in 10 years. Uh, I was a personal trainer. I was a court reporter. I, I had my own moving company. I built furniture. I drove a tractor. I picked oranges. I was a cook. I sold encyclopedias. I was a waiter. I was a chef. You know, and I was good at a lot of different things. And in some ways, it helped me work that chip off my shoulder. But I was also you know, um, still, you know, an angry 20 year old and did a lot of partying and drinking. And after one particularly, uh, big night, I woke up kind of afraid that if I, if I keep on that route, I might not wake up yeah. the next morning. Mm -hmm. So I, I just spent about five days in really deep prayer and, uh, meditation and like asking the universe, what do I, what, what's my purpose? What am I supposed to do? I need something that that's meaningful. I can't just drift anymore. And, um, and I, I realized in the, on the fifth day of that, that, um, 
there's millions and millions of children having the experience I had. Mm. And they're there right now waiting. And I walked into a school and I said, I want to volunteer. I want to work with the kids that are driving the teachers crazy. <laughs> and uh, they brought me in with open arms. And six months later, I was the crisis intervention specialist at a camp for kids that have been thrown out of every other summer camp in the country. And I loved it and I was good at it. And they, I felt like home. And, um, you know, and then that, that, that was the beginning. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. And, you know, there is something to be said about a lived experience and then turning around and being able to share or help somebody who's in a very similar situation. I believe that it just helps you connect even more with the kids. So I think that's, I love it. And then so the book itself, Raising Lions and, and the methods that you teach in there and the Raising Lions approach, did that sort of happen once you finished college and then you had all this sort of experience working with the kids and you were able to put it together into something succinct like a book or did that sort of evolve over time? It's a great question because it, it definitely evolved. I'm, I'm a very intuitive person. So when I walked in and started working with the kids and particularly at the summer camp that was it, it was like i was there was two people uh, inside me there was the eight-year-old defiant angry impulsive and there was the 28 year old and they were that knew if you needed some boundaries and some back and forth and how do you do that and they both were speaking at the same time so it was like working with myself mm -hmm. and so things came out of my mouth in that first year or two that later I, un, I only understood later the importance of what I was doing. And so gradually I developed the method first mm -hmm. and then I went back to college um, and I, I got my degree when I was 40 and then I got my master's degree when I was 42. And, um, and so, and it was really because I wanted to learn how to better articulate and to write about what I was seeing. And, um, and then a couple years after my, master's degree, I, I had a particularly, uh, probably my most challenging client to that point or uh, child I worked with. And, um, and it was in the middle of that case when I had a sort of revelation about why what I did worked and what the cultural shift was that was causing so much of what I, I had seen. And at that point, that's when I thought I, I need to write a book. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm so, we're so glad you did. And Thanks. you spell it all out really nice and clearly. And I love the way it's organized. So for those of you listening, I mean, if you find yourself even saying for one second, like, I just don't know how to tackle this, or my child feels like they're really strong willed. Just, you have to, I just can't tell you enough, but you have to grab this book. So I want to kind of start where you talk a little bit about this idea of connection and power and why kids and why parents have to really understand both, like that both matter. And I yeah. think it is a really important part of your work. So can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean and how you define that in terms of like children and why they need connection and why they're, they do have all this power and what do we do about that? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of my work is, is, is based on psychoanalytic theory. Um, there were books that I, I it took me four years to get through uh, of reading over and over before I really took it in. And so there's a distillation of that into the, the, the developmental model that the book um, says. And because I, I like things that are simple, I want, if I can't explain it to you, I don't feel like I fully understand. It. So, so child development, it isn't really well understood. You know, we're in a, we're really in this primitive stage of understanding the human mind and child development. And so uh, one of the things that it became really clear is that children are moving through stages of understanding their relationship of who they are and who you are. And, um, and those, and, and you have to understand those stages to understand how to react to what they're doing and what the purpose of it is. So essentially they, they come into the world in this feeling of oneness and connection where we're all one thing, but by about a, a year in, they start to realize you're separate. You have a separate will this creates an anxiety that needs to be resolved and a question. How are we different? How are we the same? Who has power? Who's in control? How does this work? This is on a very basic level. This is what children are sussing out. You know, by the time they're a year old, certainly they're fully into it by the time they're two. Right. 
And so you start to see conflict, not because children are just unable to deal with different situations, but because children use conflict to ask questions. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. This key piece, right? Understanding that conflict has a purpose. Conflict is when your child wakes up one morning and screams bloody murder because you gave them the blue bowl and they want the red bowl and their sister has the red bowl. It has nothing to do with the blue or red bowl because probably the day before they wanted the, they wanted the bowl they have now, the, the blue bowl. And so it's like, this doesn't seem to make any sense. And you go into an explanation about the bowls or trying, it has nothing to do with the bowl. Yeah. It has to do, and this is the vast majority of conflict has an underlying question that gets down to, I'm here, I have power, but do you have power? Mm. Are you like me? How does this work? Who's in charge? And when we just, when we treat that moment as if it's a, an inability to, to, to deal with the preference of the bowl color, uh, we're not going to answer that question that they're asking. And we're going to allow that anxiety that started it to continue and maybe even get bigger and more complicated. So this is the, the so they're, they're exercising and they're answering a question. And in the end, they, they, they need to give their autonomous action. Okay. But the, they're also looking for the connection. That's the question. And, and, and the connection happens not in, moving the boundary or mm -hmm. simply comforting them through what looks like discomfort, it actually comes from um, finding a way to hold that boundary so that they know you're just as willful as they are without judging them, without shaming them, without negating them. Yes. But hold that boundary so that they can come into knowledge of you and that anxiety about the unknowing of, of themselves and you can start to drift away. Yeah, I love that so much. And I think that you talk about the two hand parenting approach and that idea of like your child is really taking their power, expending it out, and they're looking for somewhere for it to butt up against. And why not be at the parent, the hand of the parent to say, whoa, I've got you. I have just as much power. I can keep you safe. It's really, I've always looked at yeah. it when a child is doing that, is that it is their way of asking. I, I can't control all of this happening to me right now. Who's keeping me safe? Who is, where is the boundary? Where is the person? Where is my person who's going to be able to show me how to, what to do with all of this sort of disruption or all these emotions that are flooding out of me? And I agree, it's not about the blue bowl or the, the red cup or whatever the issue might seem to be. So this kind of makes me think a lot about when I'm coaching parents, I talk a lot about this idea of eggshell parenting, I call it. Because what I'm finding is that the more the child is described as strong-willed or challenging or whatever, you know, that that adjective is, I find that the parent then is almost backing away and trying to find ways to manipulate or to just change things in that child's external environment. So that right. way they're not running into the challenge or it's almost like they don't want to do anything that's going to cause that child to have a big tantrum or, or whatever the, the behavior is that they don't want to have happen. So talk to me a little bit about like, why is that a problem in terms of what is, what's happening to the child when we are eggshell parenting? Yeah, so the, the interesting thing is what you just described, that process of you see the strong-willed child and you create more accommodations it is uh, precisely the opposite of what they need. A stronger-willed child needs a stronger boundary. Now, they also need it given with a sense of autonomy, mm -hmm. okay? And that's the key part. It's not simply about, you know, everything I do when I teach families how to you know, because I do I do personal consults with parents and I do webinars and I do trainings for teachers. But there's always two aspects to that. There is a structure of how to move through consequences that feel non-punitive, but encourage, you know, timely uh, self-regulation. So there's a structure of how that moves, like a, a, an action map that the parent follows. But there's a relationship, and those th two things are inseparable. The relationship is giving autonomy and taking away judgment. And But the problem is old school parenting just gave 
a structure, usually a bad structure mm -hmm. that was you know, zero to 100, or that felt punitive. And new school parenting just focuses on the relationship. Yeah. And the truth is, they have to be married, and they are inseparable. The, the, your relationship will not make sense, and your child will make, not take you seriously if there isn't a cause and effect structure to their actions and to your boundaries. They're not going to take you seriously. And that means they never meet the hand and they yeah. never know who you are. And that is experienced by uh, as abandonment. So the, the language in there becomes crucial. Uh, uh, and so setting boundaries where you're, you're acknowledging their autonomy, where you're removing the judgment, but you're firmly holding a boundary and even a, a natural penalty that happens when the longer you take to adhere to it. Yeah. These kind of things are, are really important. So important. I know. And it's it's interesting. I agree with you. It's like we have this kind of space in terms of parenting right now where I think there are a lot of people who resisted the way they were parented. It was maybe too strict, too cold, too rigid, harsh, whatever, you know, it might have been. And then I think that pendulum swung so far the other way that you have a lot of parents now who are and you talk about this a lot in the book, and I love that you reference it, but there's a lot of explaining and a lot of like giving choices. To me, it has become the number one go-to process that I think most parents feel is like the answer to everything. So I'll be working with the family and I'll say something like, okay, well, if, I want to highlight two things here. One is, I think it's important that we recognize how a child's behavior is not isolated from you, the family unit or the parent. And I think what yeah. I find often, and I'm sure you see this yourself, is that a parent will come to you and say, how do I get them to stop doing this? Right? Like as if you're here, your child's here, they're doing a behavior that you don't like, and that just give me something to do so I can tell them where there, there's much more to it, right? Like, is you know, what are you, what are you doing in response to the behavior? What's happening right before the behavior? Like there is a lot to consider. It isn't just that that child is this separately just engaging in this and it has nothing to do with your involvement or what you might be doing. So I want to really think about, to talk about that connected piece, the idea of like, they're not on their own island, I think is the way that you've described it too. And I love yeah. this sort of that language. And then also I was getting at the idea that then I think what ends up happening is most parents default strategy is to give choices and why that it's just not very effective. Like I've seen, I mean, I've literally watched a parent give probably 25 choices from the time the child was walking through the front door of the center all the way to my therapy room to the chair like who do you want to open the door who should unzip your coat do you want mommy or daddy to walk with you do you want like it was just this constant you know just pummeling the child with questions and I thought oh my goodness like just he probably doesn't care who zips his coat or who hangs it up like just let him in the room you know <laughs> keep it moving like you know and so I just think it's become the default sort of strategy because again I think we're looking for where are we supposed to land because it what happened what you know in terms of the way we were parented might not have felt great so then we want to feel like we're going to explain and teach everything away and give all these choices but there is still this space where I think we're all kind of missing the mark a little bit yeah and I think um I mean there was so much uh I th in what you just said that I think is important you know the over managing of kids. And I think that there's so much, a lot of times when I'm talking with parents, I will say, um, you know, it, the hardest part about what I'm going to teach you is um, that I need you to do a lot less. I need yeah. you to do a lot less. And that all of that talking is communicating anxiety and low expectation. And that's what they're responding to. So, you know, and a lot of times I'll go to someone's house and I'll, I'll show them how to, you know, you've got a two and a half year old who's, you know, um, running around and really enjoying, the, you know, kind of causing havoc and maybe even in, in the, they're the leader of the group in their preschool and they lead the team and all, and whether it's good or bad, one way or the other, and they need to need to show them how to do a break, like can a two and a half year old do a break? And I'm like, sure, and I'll take them through the process. And at the end of that process, they'll be like, wow, we've tried that before, but we talk about 10 times as much as you do during that last three minutes because I'm leaving this space for them to figure it out, for them to solve the problem, mm -hmm. not trying to manage them. And the truth is, I don't know how they're going to work their way through. I'm just setting up a, a very simple maze that motivates them to sort of recognize what I'm asking and take that seriously and removing the judgment and letting them learn that pattern so that they know, okay, this is how this guy works. And this is what happens when, you know, what yeah. they, when they need something. 
So, um, and I feel like I, I, that um, you might have to jump back in because I- Yeah, no, I, I love it. And I was actually right when you were saying that, I wanted to have you explain a little more about breaks too, because I love the idea of breaks. I think for two reasons. One, I think there has to be, and you talk about this a lot, but there has to be an action with what you're saying, right? There's a lot of talking in parenting right now, and there isn't a lot of doing. And so when we're not assigning an action or doing something like when this happens, then this happens, then the child's just tuning us out. And so um, can you talk about breaks and how you teach parents to use them and when to use them? Right. So um, I'll start by saying that in my when I published volume or the first edition of Raising Lions, I used the term timeouts, uh, time mm-hmm. right? And um, and then, I, you know, there was all this pushback and I, I looked at the pushback and I realized, oh, everybody else has these very different assumptions about timeout than I do in terms of it's usually paired with isolation. It's usually pair, paired with like a long punitive consequence. Uh, it's usually paired with judgment. It's it's paired with anger. It's paired with all of these things that I don't like. Yeah. And so I thought, well, I want to differentiate from that, even though I'm doing something different here. And I changed the word to breaks. Right. And I think that part of the reason that timeouts were done in this way is that the part of the baggage that we we are the parenting generation takes with bound to boundaries comes from their experience as children. Mm-hmm. And that baggage is that we pair a boundary with being negated, mm. with a loss of autonomy, mm-hmm. with being judged, you know, uh, all of these things we pair with it. So we, because we don't want to do those things, we don't do the consequence. So we hesitate to give that consequence. What I'm talking about is shifting the paradigm entirely. Yes. So this is not simply a set of tools that you use without changing your thinking. My hope is you use the tools and helps you to change your thinking. But if your thinking doesn't change, you're not going to get the big long term results you want. Okay, so I'm I'm not dealing with reward and punishment. I'm dealing with cause and effect and I'm giving them a lot of autonomy. But so back to your question about the break, a break is a way to assert your need while giving respect and autonomy and making that need and your words have real weight and seriousness, okay? Because most of the time, parent one of the biggest complaints is parents tell me some version of he doesn't know that no means no, mm-hmm. right? right? And and I and I'll say to them that's because no doesn't mean no, not here, mm-hmm. not yet. Mm-hmm. It means. It, you can do it three more times. And then when mommy's voice starts to get that special pitch that means she's annoyed, that that's your last chance. Mm-hmm. And then if you're really sweet, you could buy an extra chance <laughs> or you'd avoid a consequence. That's what no means. But it doesn't mean no. It, so yeah. how do we get, get our words to actually have this firm meaning? And so it's an action consequence delivered in such a way so that is immediate allows self-prompting and gives a a sense of high expectation and respect. How does that look? Okay. In a school, uh, because I've trained a lot of schools to use this, you know, um, I'll be on I need you to take a break for a minute. Okay. Now you might've had your hands on, on your friend. And so I'm not identifying the behavior. First step. I don't go, I'll be on uh, I need you to keep your hands to yourself. Mm-hmm. Take a break. I just say I need you to take a break. Okay. And then I go, look, you can take the break or not take the break. But if you don't, the break gets longer. And in a moment, I have to count down and it becomes a five minute break. Let's pr- pretend you're a second break. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll let you decide. But I don't know, tell me why. We can talk about it after. Mm-hmm. You're not in trouble. Yeah. Five, four, three. Oh, you go and sit, or you don't. Three, two, one. Now it's a five minute break. If you don't do the five minute break, the next step in the school I'm thinking about where yeah. we did the research. Um, it, okay, you have to report to the office. You're not in trouble. You're not going to get a lecture, but that time you will have to make up during a preferred time doing classwork. And you follow this simple pattern, right? So it's meant to motivate the child to take the move, settle themselves for one minute, Mm -hmm. 
which is essentially it's a prefrontal cortex exercise. Yes. You've stopped yourself within this 15 minute, 15 second time frame. You've regulated, even if you're angry about what's happened, you're self prompting because I didn't tell you what the behavior was mm -hmm. and you're coming back. Conversation, if you need it, I'll have it later. But most of the time, kids will choose not to have that conversation. I know. I love that so much. I remember watching you demonstrate it, I think, really beautifully, too, on a video on your website, on the Raising Lions website. And it is so true. I mean, kids know why they're being interrupted or stopped or asked to come and take a break. They're very rarely like, oh, that, that was so confusing. What just happened? They know that it's not, I think you talk about this, like one of the types of behaviors is like a benign behavior, right? There are a handful yeah. of kids where it's like they just don't know and, and we explain yeah. it once and then they, they don't ever do it again because that's why they did it out of lack of not knowing. But I love the idea of the break because you're exactly right. It just It's an interruption to what's happening and then you're taking them from that space. But I also like what another point that I remember hearing you mention too is that you do stay with them. So I think the difference and I think what we look at with the timeout is left and they're like left in a corner or, you know, I'm thinking of like a traditional what people think of with timeouts. And so that's not really the case. Like you can stay there, but still the responsibility is on the child to eventually regulate themselves for that minute, correct? And then they're able yeah. to then resume. Yeah. And so, and, um, you know, but, and there's a lot of particulars about how that works out, that why it works really well. So for instance, if I, if I ask a child to take a one minute break and whether it's a, you know, say a four-year-old, um, and I'm teaching parents to do that pattern, um, I'm not going to move. I'm going to say, uh, you know, Brian, I need you to take a break for a minute. You can sit right there. It's going to be someplace easy, someplace close, three minutes, three feet away, maybe from where they are, or, or maybe, Maybe near me, but doesn't have to be. Just you can sit right there for one minute, You're not in trouble. And but I'm not going to move to them to try and guide them there and sit with them in that first step because I want that I want to set up a pattern where they self-regulate. They're moving autonomously and they're sitting on their own, and then they can go right back. It's the super easy step, okay. Only when you get to the third third step in that stage, maybe it goes one minute, three minute, five minute with that. Am I going to move to that child? But now it's the longer break because mm -hmm. I want them to be making choices and feeling autonomous and self-regulating. And I think they can do that, um, particularly as we take that charge out and we set a simple pattern they can adapt to. Yeah, no, I love that. Can I um, sort of ask, what do you do in the case of a, the child? Because this is what I would get asked, and I think this is what parents yeah. are asking. Like the kid who's always like, I'm not taking a break. Like it doesn't matter how yeah. many times you're going to say it. It doesn't, I'm thinking of kids I've worked with. I'm thinking of Absolutely. families I've worked with. So what happens then? Yeah, so that's, you know, almost nobody calls me at least uh, who doesn't have that problem. <laughs> That's universal. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, if, if, you, if, you, if it was easy, you wouldn't be calling. Yeah. So, um, so the truth is, I think it's completely natural to move through that stage. And I will say for people who've read my book, right, um, there's a, it starts with a, a description of a girl I call Madison. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a true story, but they changed the names. And uh, I do a protocol where there's, you know, in that case, there were actually four steps, but um, she was eight years old and it, we did step one was a break, then a two minute break, then five minutes at the crisis room. And then if she was physically violent, all of a sudden, you know, she might have to go to the isolation room. And that was another step. Mm -hmm. But we did that pattern. Step one, step two, step three, step four. We did it for 10 days. And before she took the one minute break, even once. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, after five days, she said to me, uh, I'm, 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 the teacher said to me, he said, I don't think uh, this is working because she's never taken the one minute break. And my response was, she has 10, she has eight years of precedence that says she can train you to change the rules. Exactly. And she has 10, eight years of success doing that. And you think in five days, you're going to change your mind. The amazing thing was on the 10th day, she took that first one minute break. She adapted to the framework. Yeah. And so parents often think, uh, I'll try something. I'll try some, some tool, some magic way of saying it and see if I get a result. But children are scientists and scientists don't do one trial. 
they do 100 trials mm -hmm. and then they look at the, 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 the result. And children are the same way. They're building models based on conditional probability. Now, this is from Al, um, Allison Gopnik at Berkeley. She's like, you know, they're, they're using con children. 18 month olds are doing building models based on conditional probability to understand how the world works. It's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to do a break process and, and they're going to, they're going to go, I, if I, if I run away as soon as they start counting and they can't find me, they'll never do the break again because mm -hmm. they'll know it doesn't work. No, you, you keep, I would sit in the room. I'd still move through those steps. Yep. And then I'd casually wander over, find the child and say, well, it's now it's the long break and I have to sit with you until you take it. And they're going to cry and they're going to sit with them. And you're not going to let them get up and say, look, I, I got it. Unfortunately, I, I, I can't make you get quiet, but I got to wait until you're finished until we start that break. And now they realize, oh, that rule works even if I run out of the room. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then they're going to try a hundred different things to see if that pattern changes. And just like the freeway exits, when you drive to your friend's house or, you, you know, those exits don't change because you're running late. Yeah. <laughs> because you've convinced the exits to move a little further yeah. or a little closer because, you know, you need them yeah. to. But that's how children are able to train their parents. And I'm saying give them a model they can adapt to and they will adapt. Yeah. So, yeah, they can go through it. But, you know. And the great thing about that, too, is like once you provide, I mean, even in a school or two parents, once you give them that model, and I know even when I work with parents, I see this, I think that alone really grounds and anchors them so that they're able to stay calm through it. And they're not scrambling, trying to figure out like, okay, well, they ran away, forget it, it didn't work. Like, it, you know, it's, it, they have something to kind of go by. And I also yeah. think too that, I, I mean, I warn parents of this, that it, it will always get worse before it gets better, right? For the same reasons you're describing. Like for eight That's years, right. that little yeah. girl had a really effective system as far as she was concerned, right? Like she produced the outcome in a lot of times that she, maybe she wanted, or yes. in many cases, that was all she knew. So to undo that is going to take time. And, the, and you're right. A lot of times it's like, well, what's the thing I can say? Or what's the one, like, no, you're going to say right. a lot of times, right? It's going to take time. Right. And I remember when I was, um, I was in my clinical fellowship year when I had just finished graduate school and um, I was working with a little girl who was not a vocal communicator. She was four years old and we had been getting along great and everything had been going fine. I really hadn't seen any role kind of challenging behaviors or anything that really interfered with therapy and all of a sudden one day she started to throw all the therapy materials off the table. She started to spit and try to bite and scratch and again she couldn't communicate. So her parents indicated to me that they were also concerned and seeing a lot of the same things at home. So I reached out to my mentor and she's still somebody that I respect a lot and she has a lot of years in the field and she's actually a behaviorist. And so she came in and she watched the session and she gave me the best advice. And she said to me, look, she said, I'm going to tell you something and I don't want you to be defensive and I don't want you to feel like I'm I'm insulting anything that you did or anything like that. But the minute you can understand this point, she said, you will connect with every single child that walks through your door. And she said, understand and remember, it is always us. That girl is only responding to you. It is always yeah. us. So she goes, yeah. I'm going to tell you what to change. It has nothing to do with her. And so anyways, in working with her, we started to realize I was giving her tasks that were far too challenging. She felt incredibly frustrated and didn't have the language to say. She didn't understand what I was asking her to do. She needed additional support to get through those harder tasks because we also didn't want to throw in the towel and assume she just wasn't capable of learning it. So there was a lot to it. Like you're saying, it isn't just one or two things, but we completely revamped what we were doing, put some supports in place for parents at home and ultimately got her to a much happier, more content place and pushed along in therapy and, and got some really great results. But I've never forgotten that. And I do always think of that no matter the child, no matter the diagnosis, it doesn't really matter. My job is always to think about how can I connect with this child? How can I learn first? How do they learn? What are the challenges? What are the areas that they're indicating to me through their behavior that is working or not working? And then what can I shift and change in the model that I'm presenting that's going to help that child thrive? So I think it's so critical that we always recognize our own involvement in that dynamic, the adult or the parent. Yeah, I, I, I just wrote when I was, you were speaking and I wrote down, 
you say it's always us and and i think that this is this is really um to the crux of it at one point i said to someone you know what my method is is it's how you would act and how you would behave if you thought your children were so much cap more capable than you actually do um, and i think what happens is like no one starts out with a thought that children are broken mm -hmm. that there's something wrong with them no one starts out with that they everyone starts out with they're perfect they're wonderful they're great but but when your efforts fail and you try one thing after another after another and you're exhausted and you've done it for year after year and things keep failing you naturally go maybe there's something wrong with them mm -hmm. and what i'd like to say is that we're just at the beginning of understanding children yes we're really, you know uh this is like this is psychology young is the youngest science we're just figuring this out. I, we, there's a tendency to think because there's so many specialists, because there's so many degrees, because there's all different kinds of things going on, that we know everything. We don't. Mm -hmm. We know very little. And and a great any great neuro, neuro, neurologist will tell you that. One of my favorite bo books about neurology in the beginning introduction, the, the neurologist said he said. Uh, well, I'm going to try and be as clear and as accurate to the facts as possible. You should know from right now that 80% of what I'm going to tell you is going to be proven wrong in the next 25. Years. <laughs> yeah, <it's true. laughs> and I'm the best. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we need to remember that. So yeah. this is there are answers, and it, it but it requires stepping out of old paradigms and just to to have hope and keep looking. Um, you know and when you do that, when you can shift into that and, and eventually and hopefully in our lifetimes, a, a, a new paradigm, a wave of that new paradigm will be embraced. And and but right now, a lot of what people are being taught and a lot and they're doing it with the best intention <coughs> is wrong. Yeah. It's not working. Right. I know it's actually one of the first questions I ask, like, just ask yourself, is it working? Right. Like people will yes. do. It's amazing. They'll just keep doing the same thing over and right. over. And you're like, it's but it's your you've been in the same situation for so long. Yeah. Like, it's OK. Right. And I think there's I think with parents, especially exactly like you mentioned, after, you know, you've been dealing with maybe a certain challenge for so long and so long, I think there starts to be this feeling of like, it, I must not be doing a good job. Maybe something is wrong with my child, um, yeah. right? We start to have all these self-doubts, and I think that just causes them to feel even more defeated instead of just saying to themselves, well, what can I do? Like, just like my mentor told me that day, you have to ask yourself, like, what is it that you can shift and change in these sessions? How can we look at it from a little bit of a different lens instead of just looking at that yeah. behavior under a microscope and going, how do we get her to stop throwing? Like the throwing wasn't really the, the thing, you know, she was trying to communicate something completely different. And so I always think it's interesting. And um, can we talk a little bit about the idea of, I sort of wanted to pick your brain about this a little bit. I feel like a lot of the kiddos that I work with that have ADHD, there are a lot of times sleep struggles kind of associated with it or in relation to it. I'm not saying like it causes it, but it just feels like almost always those same children struggle with sleep. Do you have any thoughts on um, like sleep challenges that families are facing or you know, or does that kind of all fall under the same thing in terms of if we don't set those firm boundaries, children are also going to fight us when we tell them it's time to sleep or it's time for our bodies to rest, like assuming that they think they have all the power. I don't know. I was yeah. just curious to know your thoughts on those sleep struggles. All right. So I would say, you know, I, the, one of the things that popped out when you said that is that um, medications can often cause sleep struggles with adhd i mean i was on medication for a long time and i had i had and for me the big outcome was i i just didn't eat much mm -hmm. so i was i was very small when i went into high school and i i almost doubled my weight in the four years in high school and added a foot in height yeah. so because i came i came off the medication um so but if that's not the case i think that that um there's a no i think it's a, that's one of those multi-level layered things you know i think yeah. part of it has to do with add kids do do better overall when they can get out and exercise and do more and there's less opportunity for that and if you live in a cold climate you're going to have less opportunity for that but they've done studies that you know kids who are struggling with attention mm -hmm. uh, 
that are put into a class where they ride a bike before school every day for 25 minutes focus better and have less behavior problems from that exercise. So there is a tie-in and, and, and sometimes it's hard to get that done. There's another tie-in with simply the motivation the, that are you setting boundaries? Um, because the thing about bedtime is it's one of those things you can't make somebody go to sleep, mm -hmm. just like you can't make somebody eat. That's right. You can't make somebody poop from the toilet. Yep. You know? <laughs> it's like the kids know the precise things you can't make me do. And those become the flashpoints for power struggles because they do have quite a lot of power. And if you're going to tackle those, first of all, you need to change the relationship with conflict in general mm -hmm. and not just those moments. And if you're creating too many accommodations, you're missing those opportunities to change that relationship, to create that defiant response. Uh, some children and most of the families who call me have children who are much more interested in power than approval. Mm -hmm. Super important, right? Yeah. Most of our parenting models right now have to do with explanations, information, cajoling information. And if you look at it at its core, it, it assumes that a child wants to get your approval. Some children don't want your approval. Yes. They want to feel the power. And there's a dozen very important reasons for that that are completely natural. And you might have one child who likes approval and you might have another child that likes power. And, uh, and sometimes it has to do with that dynamic. You have, uh, you, you know, you come into the world and you have an older sister who's three years older, who's really good at getting the approval of your parents. She's taken that role in the power structure mm -hmm. of the family. She's the Luke Skywalker, or she's the Princess Leia who wants the approval and is the hero. Yeah. What position is left? Darth Vader's right. left. <laughs> yeah. Opposite set of rules, mm -hmm. opposite motivation, very powerful. Very exciting. Number one costume on Halloween. Yep. Because kids love it. Right. right. And when you think of that too, it it does exactly what we were talking about. Like, so then the parent looks at child number one, who let's say is the one who does want approval and they think, yeah. oh, our, this model worked or everything I'm doing is working, right. right? And now here comes the second child who has a whole other set of, you know, they don't care about the approval piece of it and they're determined to kind of express their power. And then the parent's going, well, we think what we did worked because look at the older one. So clearly something's wrong with little one over here because it's not effective, right? Or it's not taking on the same form. So it's interesting that, you know, I've always said that something that I just believe in is like, you're not gonna always parent fair. I have two kids and they're older now, but they had always and still do very different needs. So like the way I parented my son and the way I parented my daughter, my husband and I would both agree on this, that we did it differently based on what they needed and based on what boundaries they needed and based on what areas where we knew they, you know, they needed to be able to be more resilient or try things. So I think it's interesting. We can become so rigid sometimes in that parenting space and stick to like our plan. And so sometimes I'll say to a parent, you know, if it's not working for you, let's, can we just shift one thing, right? Like, let's take one thing off the table. Like, what's one thing you can kind of say, all right, it's not working. Maybe I won't, you know, result, you know, resort to punishment, or maybe I won't, or maybe I'll think of this in a new way and not only think about this idea of approval and just gaining approval. And you're right. That's a really important point of, you know, a child that doesn't really, that the power is the value for them, not the approval. And so you're going to go about it all wrong. So this kind of leads me to another question that I wanted to pick your brain about was one of the things that I do in my role, both in my day job and even when I help parents is I sometimes will watch other therapists with working with children. And almost thank you so much for joining me today. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to subscribe, rate and review this podcast wherever it is that you're listening right now. And what really makes my day is if you share or recommend the podcast to a friend, it is the greatest compliment. If you have not already, head on over to theparentingreframe.com where you can subscribe to get my weekly newsletter, Parenting Skimmed. Ten sentences delivered to your inbox every Thursday to help you parent and live a better life. It's for the parent who constantly told me, I just don't have time to read. Make sure to come and say hi to me on Instagram at The Parenting Reframe. My DMs are always open and I love hearing from you. Until next time, this is Albiona. So I can't completely feel convinced that they're doing it for behavior, but maybe, you know, she said, well, I, what if they're doing it to see what I'm going to do? I said, well, that's not the same thing to me. 
Yes. Right. I'm not seeking attention. I'm wanting to see if I throw a toy across the room, what happens here? Are you going to try to educate me on throwing toys inside? Like, what, you know, I don't think that's attention. So how do you right. feel? Do you get that a lot? Do you get that quite like this sort of certainty from parents that kids are just doing it for attention? They're just trying to get under my skin. Yeah, I think um, I, I think I certainly hear that a lot. I think a lot of people use that. It's just about attention and getting attention. But I, I think it's I think there's a little validity to that, but not a lot. I agree with you in terms of the 80, 20 percent. Um, what while you were talking, what I thought about was how. Excess information motivates defiance. Mm. So yes. I'll start with just a, a little bit of a research piece. So University of California in Santa Barbara did a one year, one year long research um, of an elementary school pre-K through six that implemented my method in the classroom. Uh, so they did it before where they did 600 observations and then they did 1200 observations after I came in and did uh, staff training. And we, we looked at teacher responses to behavior. We looked at how, how often there was off-task behavior. We looked at, um, you know, whether the teachers were using positive tone, negative tone, and whether they were giving information about behavior, where they, they were identifying. So that moment when I said, you know, uh, I'll be on a, um, I need you to keep your hands to yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe I say, then I say, and I need you to take a break. But uh, I gave you an information prompt, identified the behavior, you know, um, or I say, I'll be on a, if you do that again, you're going to stay in during recess. You know, information, information. These are all information prompts. And um, over the course of the, the the study, they showed that across the board there was an average of a 50% drop in all off-task behavior school-wide. Wow. So half the the, the problem behavior stops. So but there were differences from class to class, and you had some classes where the teacher got an 80% drop in off-task behavior. And another class where they got a 20%. So 50 was just that average out. And we want to know what's the difference between those classes that got the super result and the average result uh, or the mediocre result. And, um, and the primary piece was, did they give information about behavior? Oh my goodness. So simply me telling you what the behavior is really reduce the effectiveness of the boundaries we were setting and reduce the self prompting that was that, that was going on because when you don't identify the behavior and you set a small action consequence without a judgment okay you allow the child to self prompt without a defensive reaction mm -hmm. internally you're going to say because i didn't i need to keep my hands to myself mm -hmm. not going to cause a battle it's going to cause a new habit okay so in, on a broader level, if we look at parenting across the board, we, our parenting and our technology have become this barrage of information. 90% of it around our behavior, children don't need. Mm -hmm. If you froze all those moments and you said, hold on, you know, uh, Diana, what was I, I will, you can go to Legoland with your two best friends on Saturday if you can tell me what I was about to correct about your behavior. 90% of the time, maybe 99% of the time, they could figure it out. Mm -hmm. But we stole that moment from them. Yeah. We stole a, a, a moment to, to be autonomous and solve a problem. That basic urge that starts when they're two and they go, I do it. I do it. Mm -hmm. I do it. Mm -hmm. We want to be autonomous. Children want to solve that problem. If you steal that, you demotivate it and you actually create a motivation to just push back and do the opposite because they want the autonomy. Back. Yes, that is really powerful. And I think the idea of like just even some, I mean, we're not even talking a big explanation here. You're just saying by naming and describing the behavior and then the break, we have a completely different set of circumstances on our hands. Yeah. And in most cases, you're, you're make, most people are not even just naming it and giving the break. They're naming it, naming it, naming it, naming mm -hmm. it, naming it. Mm -hmm. And then with a charge in their voice going, you need to take a break. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And everyone's <laughs> so, frustrated. Everything's canceled. Yeah. Santa's not coming. And the scientist in front of you building a model, just built a model that says I can do it four or five times until your voice get, get, takes that shrill tone. And then I need to back off. 
Uh, yeah. You know, and so they're going through the whole day moving based on the data that you gave them, and then you're angry about it. Mm-hmm. It's exactly right. And I think there's, you know, I wrote an article about this not that long ago, and I talked about my own parenting experience in it, but I was saying that essentially, like, I no longer follow this idea that, like, my goal is to make my kids happy. I always want to make sure my kids are happy. Like, it is it is a separate wish that like as their mother I do hope that they are content in their life you know but that it is not my job to always make sure they're happy like that I have to let them struggle I have to let them go through hard moments I have to let them have I can't go in and fix it and so much of my personality is to fix so it was a lot of undoing in myself right a lot of reflective work and sitting with that and going like let's say i didn't do anything right let's say my response was nothing a lot of times what you kind of talk about as well too like there is so much value and not filling that void but just letting them have that experience so i love your work in that you're really indicating and saying the same thing and even from a very young age kids need a little bit they need that resistance they need that struggle all the way i mean all our whole lives really we need it so what do you say to the parent that really sits in that space where they very much struggle watching their child go through any kind of distress? Yeah, I think, all right, so I think on some level, it really, you know, I think that first of all, if you have a difficulty watching your child go through stress, it probably has to do with your own experiences going through stress as a child. Yes. So there's, there's, there's an expression I said years ago, which is, Typically, we are not parenting the child in front of us so much as we are parenting the child inside of us. So our reaction comes out not to what they need, Mm -hmm. given their life, but to what we needed in that moment in our lives. And so that's natural. That's that's at first instinct. But I would say, let's step back and look at what happiness is. Because happiness is not uh, an endless day of, you know, lounge chairs and margaritas Mm -hmm. at the beach. That's not what, you know, surveys of human happiness. I'm thinking about Mihai, Shiksent Mihai, his book, Flow, mm-hmm. which is about human happiness. Uh, it's sort of the, the pinnacle book. And peak experiences have to do with people struggling to do something important that they can bring their all to that takes enormous effort and is typically frustrating, um, but they accomplish something. That accomplishment is filled with pain and difficulty and setbacks. That's happiness. Mm -hmm. It's connection. It's purpose. It's going through struggle. It's being sore the next day. So if you want your children to be happy, you damn well better be okay with them being unhappy with you at least a couple days every month. That's right. That's exactly. You want them happy at 18. That's never going to happen if you can't let a day go by with them being unhappy with you. Yeah, because they're supposed to not like certain days. It's not supposed to be easy. People don't walk in, you know, to 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 difficulty uh, and training uh, as a child in particular, just voluntarily. Sometimes that boundary is is set and it's a wall they have to climb over to get to where they want. That's okay. They're mad at you for putting the wall there. but You know, they need the muscles of, of climbing over to be happy at 18. Yes, exactly. And I know it was funny because, you know, kids, I've always said kids have taught me more than any any textbook, any professor, any, right? Like just in years of working with kids, you learn so much. But even as a parent with my daughter, and she was young, she must have been maybe eight or nine. We had just lost a close family member. And she was saying something to me like, you know, I wish we didn't have to feel sadness. I wish we could just feel happy all the time. And I didn't say anything. And I just kind of nodded my head and was just, you know, affirming what she said. And then she said, but if we only felt happy all the time and we never felt sad, we wouldn't know how good it is when we feel happy. Like she understood the duality of like, you need to exactly what you're saying. Like if you don't understand moments of struggle, if you don't understand unhappy moments, gosh, when you, when you get the thing you need or when you get to the top, so to speak, you would never appreciate it if you just, everything was a breeze, you know? And so I think that kids intuitively already know that. It's that we're jumping in and preventing it at every turn, right? And so, um, and this is one of those areas I think um, that really there's children require that that we as a culture, we as a, as parents, go through a revolution in our own thinking, um, and 
we we are in a process that's happening where you know on one hand we've had this pendulum swing where you know um people are reacting to the parenting they had and they're mm -hmm. overreacting one way uh, but rather than just having that pendulum swing back and forth or find this medium of where the pendulum is we need to change the paradigm yeah this is a, really a new paradigm in how uh children are, are that has to do with our relationship with conflict uh, our relationship with setting boundaries for ourselves our relationship to stepping through difficulty what is happiness what is human what is mental health mm -hmm. i mean you said something earlier that i thought was essentially that mental health isn't simply found within the skull of the individual right it's it's in this web of interactions it's in the web of who you're responsible for you know mm -hmm. i you know when my wife it wakes up and says she's having a she's feeling sad today and i have to make an extra effort to try and connect with her and make the day better i feel better mm -hmm. from that effort sure yes you see because mental health isn't in your skull it's in the web of all of the people that you have responsibility for and who have responsibility for you. That web makes you so much bigger and so much more important and so much more cared for. Yes. Than just whether you feel good because you got the red bull. <laughs> Right, right. And it's not about the Red Bull, right? I think it's about the Red Bull. <laughs> I know I was working with a parent and she um she was a fixer, right? And so she did, did a lot of that. And that was almost the exact example that came up. But what happened was the, the kiddo wanted the green sippy cup and it was in the dishwasher. And yeah. I saw her walk over and she was about to pop open the dishwasher while it was running and rinse. And, and I was like, just don't. I know it's going to be so hard, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like, let him understand he just doesn't get it right now. And that's okay. Right. Like, I love there's yeah, a answer that yeah. question. Mm -hmm. She's not at it's like you're not answering. He asked you a question and you're answering in Chinese. He doesn't understand Chinese. Yes. Give him the answer in English to the question he's asking, which is who has power? Are you like me? Yeah, you're not answering that if you open the dishwasher. I think there's so much value to that question and so much value to you saying it in that way of like they're actually asking a question and it has nothing to do with what you are thinking it has to do with. And yeah, you know, it, it becomes sort of surface parenting, not meaning we're not trying to be deep about it. It's that we're just trying to fix the problem on the surface and not go in a little bit further and kind of recognize what is the child actually indicating with this behavior. And I love, I love that shift. I'm going to apply it in my own life for sure. I know like this, um, I was going to talk to you about this story and then I know we're, we're cutting close on time and I could talk to you forever. Um, this idea of sort of, I, the way I try to frame it for parents is whenever we allow that struggle to happen, but we're there. And I love, you know, when you talk about this too, there is no judgment. We're not getting upset that they're upset, right? Like I work a lot with parents of kids who have tantrums and They'll say, okay, like now what do I say during the tantrum? And I'm like, no, nothing. We say nothing, right? You don't need to say anything. There's this feeling like doing, fixing, stopping, like that the tantrum is their response. It's a developmentally appropriate response in younger children. We want to help them self-regulate. If every time you go in and come up with another offering or a second thing or a third thing yeah. or something, it just negates that opportunity for them to gain those self-regulatory skills and then they'll tan that's why we see kids at six and seven and eight still having tantrums right i had a parent reach out to me the other day and she's like my son is nine and has pretty bad tantrums i was like oh my goodness like that's not tantrums anymore right because now we've just let it happen for so long and i'm sure it's sort of bled into other areas of his life too and it can become so difficult for the parent to manage so I guess my last sort of parting question is, what do you say to parents, and this comes up often, particularly in my field of speech and language pathology, they believe that they cannot address a challenging behavior until the child has fully formed language. In other words, oh, if I'm working yes. with a parent of a child, let's not even put disorders or diagnoses in this. Let's just say the child is two, isn't talking yet. So the parent has no idea because again, back to that faulty model that we've been talking about, explain, 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 talk, talk, talk. When they don't have the ability to do that, they assume there's nothing they can really do to stop a challenging behavior. Right. So first of all, I would say children don't learn cognitively first. They learn from experiences. Okay. They have an experience. I've had parents call me with a 14 month old who's having wild tantrums and just set a pattern of behavior 
of like if she has a tantrum every time you try and put her in the high chair to eat and makes her body so rigid that you can't put her in the chair uh, until you put her on the floor and let her walk around while you follow her like a dog and feed her, you know, uh, and you need her, you want her to learn to sit there. Then when you bring her over and she starts screaming, keep her in your arms and say, I'll wait till you're ready. And then when she tries to get down, say, oh, it's time to eat. So we, we eat in the high chair. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you bring her back to the, the high chair. She starts screaming, you know, and she's really, whether you said anything or not, you could do that whole thing silently, silently yeah. but not putting her down, but waiting and that you're not trying to force her in the chair. You're not trying to talk her down. You're not bringing all this anxiety to it. You're just waiting and repeating until she realizes there's the pattern. There's the way, uh, the easiest way out of my frustrating moment. And, you know, so, I mean, I, I, I remember going to a, a woman's house who I'd worked with her, a very tough seven-year-old and, uh, twin two and a half year old and she said um i just want you to would you she said would you come and try and live my life for one morning because it it seems impossible and um and i knew the boys so i said sure so i showed up at 6 30 and my job was basically i I got three hours or two hours something uh, to wake them up get them clean get them dressed get them fed get them in the car and dropped off at preschool and elementary school and um one of the two and a half year olds had, had a speech delay. And um, and so he he got out of bed and he was in a onesie and he still had a diaper on that was wet. And he started going, ah, ah, ah. Mm-hmm. and he's looking at me and I know what he wants. He wants me to take that onesie and diaper off because it's uncomfortable and cold. Mm-hmm. And But he's whining and he's just kind of ah, ah, mm-hmm. ah, at me and I, I looked at him and I said, Matt, Matt, Matt. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what Matt, Matt, Matt is. Mm-hmm. And, and rah, rah, rah. I said, I don't know what that is. Rah, rah, rah. What, what do you need? Do you need something from me? Help. Help. Mm-hmm. It's hard for him to say that. Yeah. Help. Mm-hmm. He said, you need help? What do you need help with? Off, off, off. And so I waited and then. I said, okay. And I sat down. He came up to me. I start taking off the onesie. He starts whining again and kind of going limp. limp. I take my hands off the onesie. I put them back in my lap and I look at him. Mm -hmm. And he stops for a minute and then he stops whining. And he steps close to me and stands up. And then I continue. And I get about halfway through again and he starts to whining. And I stop and I put my hands down. Mm -hmm. We're not really having a conversation. Mm -hmm. He just needs my help, and I'm making that contingent on getting his full focus and his best use of his words. Okay, yeah. so the language has nothing to do with it. Okay, you can do it with a baby who's running away because you want to change them, and they think it's funny. And put him on top of the changing table and, and go, "I can't change you until you're still," and just wait until they're still. And the first time that might take ten minutes of crying, and but don't let them run around. I'll wait till you're ready. I'll wait till you're ready. Mm-hmm. And then they see they need to get calm and sit still. You're not going to try and pull off a poopy diaper while they're kicking and screaming and yeah. you make a mess. You're going to, they need to cooperate and they'll learn from that set of actions and they'll adjust. I so, you know, children learn through experiences first and then they bring meaning to words. Okay. From that experience. I'm going to quote you on that because that's a really good one. That's a perfect way of describing it because it is true. And, you know, I've, I mean, we've worked with several children who have absolutely no verbal communication. They might be kids who use some signs effectively or not. And you'd be amazed how much we can teach them and what we can do and all the progress we can make. So sometimes, again, it's just shifting that paradigm. Like we can't look at it in such a singular way. Like once they talk, then we'll. (laughs) It's like, no, my gosh, that's a long time. Like there's so much they'll take in by the time that, you know, if you're waiting on that to happen. So... I mean, I could talk to you forever. I want to just thank you again so much for taking the time to talk to us. But where can people find you? I know so many people need you and they need you in their homes. And I want to make sure that they're able to connect. Yeah. So the best way is RaisingLions.com. You go to RaisingLions.com. Uh, and I also have a YouTube channel with a whole host of different videos on it that I've done. And um, it's it's me film. I have a parents who I'd worked with who are now in the video acting like their children. 
Oh, it's great because I live in Los Angeles, so yeah. everybody's got a little acting experience. <laughs> uh, nice place to be. Um, and um, we, I will be starting a Substack in the next uh, month, and so there'll be a lot of new material on, available on Substack. Um, I've got a, you know, I've got about two book, two more books of stuff written that I, I have to organize into my my uh, my next book, which is a big project. And I think Substack will be a way for me to get some of that out to people a little quicker. Yeah, so, oh, um, and then I, I do, I do school trainings for staff. I do trainings for boys and girls club. I do speaking at conferences um, and I do one-on-one -on -one consults uh, via Zoom and webinars. So um, go to Raising Lions, start there. And there's plenty of ways to get a hold of me. Definitely start there. I've watched all the videos on YouTube. I love them. And they're really great at really explaining and illustrating exactly the way that your methods can be implemented. So I highly recommend starting there and get the book. The book is so good. And I can't wait for your sub stack. All right, everyone. Thank you, Joe Newman, for being here. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And until next time.